Okay, this is the uh, fifth lecture from Dr. Neil Cross on cell pathology and infection, and what we're going to focus on are oncogenes and tumour suppressor genes. Now, aspects of this might seem a bit repetitive because we're going to recover PRB and uh, P53 that we covered as part of the hallmarks of cancer, but we're going to cover it in a slightly different context here in terms of hereditary cancers and looking at different mutation spectrums in cancers. So, because these pathways are really difficult, I thought it was worth explaining them more than once. So after this session, this is what you should be able to do. You should be able to explain the role of tumour suppressors as regulators of normal cell growth and look at how these become inactivated in cancer and why they become inactivated. You should also be able to explain some mechanisms of proto-oncogene activation, different mechanisms such as gene fusions, amplification, specific mutations, and how these drive tumour formation from a proliferative point of view. And then we should also be able to work out why tumour suppressor genes are predominantly involved in hereditary cancers, whereas oncogenes are not. And we'll cover uh, a section on hereditary cancers with a particular emphasis on the retinoblastoma tumour suppressor gene, uh, which causes hereditary retinoblastoma. So I've talked about some tumour suppressor genes on the um, previous lecture, we've mentioned P53 and PRB, but in this lecture we're really going to look at some more detail about them. Um, and one thing to be clear about tumour suppressor genes is these are genes which are what we call recessively acting genes, which basically means you need to lose both copies of that tumour suppressor gene to have any action upon the cell. If the cell retains one good copy of a tumour suppressor gene, it will behave and function relatively normally. If it loses two copies, it will cease to have tumour suppressor gene function. So tumour suppressors fall into two main groups, your growth inhibitor genes, so things like uh, retinoblastoma protein coded by the RB1 gene, the P53, uh, P53 protein coded by the TP53 gene. Um, so this is one group. We've also got a, a pro-apoptotic group as well. And then we've got DNA maintenance genes, and P53 falls into this category. Now, the vast majority of tumour suppressor genes are associated with a loss of function. That means that, as I mentioned, you need to lose both copies of uh, a tumour suppressor gene to have any action on the cell. One exception to that is P53, which we're going to co cover in quite a bit of detail. But most of them are loss of function. In contrast, oncogenes are associated with a gain of function mutation. That is uh, a mutation which makes the protein uh, either superactive or overexpressed. So tumor suppressor genes are typically gene inactivating mutations, whereas proto-oncogene mutations are gene activating mutations. So this is summarized here. Tumor suppressor genes are inactivated in cancer, often by gene deletion, but often by nonsense mutations and some missense mutations. So these tumour suppressor genes are recessive in activity, the mutations are generally inactivating mutations. So this means that for a cancer cell to receive uh, a loss of a tumour suppressor gene, it must be two independent genetic events affecting both copies of that tumour suppressor gene. Now in hereditary cancers, uh, these are caused by the inheritance of one defective copy of a tumour suppressor gene. So it might be worth having to pause the video and having to stop and think of what might be the effect of that mutation on a patient that has inherited a defective copy of a tumour suppressor gene, bearing in mind that that tumour suppressor gene will be inactive or one copy will be inactive in every cell in their body. Now there's lots of hereditary cancer syndromes and these are typically caused by the inheritance of a defective uh, copy of a tumour suppressor gene. So breast cancer patients uh, who are, uh, have hereditary breast cancer tend to inherit a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation which leads them to develop quite often bilateral breast cancer um, whereas most patients would develop unilateral breast cancer. Similarly, the neurofibromatosis type 2 gene, the NF2 gene, results in something called a bilateral acoustic neuroma, so that's a, a tumour on both acoustic nerves. Defective P53, if you inherit a defective copy from one of your parents, that will result in multiple tumours forming at multiple different sites throughout that patient's life.
and similarly defective HMLH1, HMSH2 will result in hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. So the key thing about all of these diseases is you inherit one defective copy and that is passed on in a dominant fashion and the net result is the development of multiple independent tumours. Now this can be best explained using the example of retinoblastoma. And retinoblastoma comes in two forms, hereditary and sporadic. Uh, and this is caused by a germline defect in the RB1 gene for the inherited forms. And the RB1 gene codes for PRB, and we learnt about PRB in the last session. PRB helps stop the cell cycle and prevent abnormal transition through to S phase. So if you inherit a defective copy of the RB1 gene from one of your parents, then a tumour will form due to a, a single cell picking up a second mutation. And that second mutation is a somatic mutation which complements the germline mutation that has been inherited. And this occurs in almost all carriers of an RB1 mutation. That is that almost all people who inherit a defective copy of RB1 will develop at least one retinoblastoma tumour. Some patients develop bilateral disease, the tumour in each eye. Now this is what's known as the two-hit hypothesis proposed by Knudsen back in 1971 and this was even before tumour suppressor genes had been discovered but what Knudsen did is identified that some patients presented with bilateral retinoblastoma, some patients with unilateral, the bilateral cases presented earlier and if they presented early they also tended to then subsequently uh, be found with a second mutation in the other eye. And what Knudsen proposed that there must be an inheritance of one defective uh, gene that's present in every cell in the body and then sometime during that patient's life, in the case of retinoblastoma very early on, a single cell loses a second you know, the remaining good copy of RB1 and becomes RB1 deficient and that initiates cancer formation. And this can be shown using this diagram. In a normal healthy individual at conception, the individual is normal for the retinoblastoma gene at least. Occasionally in the developing um, cells in the optic nerve, uh, a single cell might lose one copy of the RB1 gene, but that doesn't matter because there's a second good copy and therefore there is no tumour formation. Very rarely, looking at about 1 in 30,000, at conception this individual is normal for RB1. At some point during development of the optic nerve, one cell accumulates a mutation in the RB1 gene and then by all bad fortune the same cell or one of its daughter cells picks up a second mutation in the other homologue of the RB1 gene, because we have two copies of it, one maternal, one paternal inherited. Once this happens, this individual cell here will start to proliferate uncontrollably, and this will form a sporadic tumour, sporadic in that it's not inherited, and this will be, uh, lead to rapid proliferation and a unilateral tumour, that is, one tumour in one eye. In hereditary retinoblastoma, the patient at conception has, is already defective for one copy of the RB1 gene, the other copy is functional. So this has been inherited from one of the parents, and you know which one of the parents it is because it is the parent that has previously had a retinoblastoma. So every single cell in this developing fetus has got one defective copy of RB1, and it only takes one single cell to lose a copy of RB1, the good remaining copy, and that will initiate tumour formation. And this is almost certain to happen. Just like it's almost certain to happen here, that it had no deleterious effects, when it happens here, it results in tumour formation, which is why these patients often present with more than one tumour. So in these patients, you often get bilateral tumour formation. In some patients, at least one tumour in all patients. So although the tumour suppressor gene is recessive in activity, it is passed on in an autosomal dominant manner because everyone who inherits one defective copy is certain to develop a tumour. So the trait, uh, the phenotype, 
is passed on in an autosomal uh, dominant manner, even though the tumor suppressor gene itself is recessive in activity. And this is just a reminder from last week, where we looked at the function of the RB1 gene product, which is the PRB protein. The PRB protein is guardian of the R point. Here is the R point down here. The function of uh, PRB is to hold on to the E to F transcription factors, and the E to F transcription factors drive S phase gene expression. So as a cell progresses through G1 phase of the cell cycle, we get growth factor signaling that induces cyclin D, induces cyclin E. Cyclin E uh, CDK partner, cyclin dependent kinase 2, will hyperphosphorylate PRB protein, releasing E to F, and E to F will drive S phase genes and allow the cell to progress through the cell cycle. This means that the RB1 gene is frequently inactivated in cancer, and within cancers we often see RB1 gene deletion, so the entire gene is gone, both copies of it, or sometimes we see deletion of one copy of the gene and a mutation in the other copy, maybe a missense mutation or a frame shift mutation. If patients inherit one defective copy of RB1, then the other homologue in the tumours is either deleted or mutated or some other mechanism of gene inactivation. And what we also see with RB1, because it's such a fundamental tumour suppressor gene, is the human papillomavirus E7 gene product specifically inactivates PRB to promote proliferation of virally infected cells. So this is a crucially important tumour suppressor gene that controls, uh, basically controls cell proliferation. Okay, so I'm now going to remind you about another major tumour suppressor gene that we covered last week, which is the P53 protein, and it's coded by the TP53 gene. And this is a fascinating tumour suppressor gene because its mechanism of in inactivation is slightly different to other tumour suppressor genes. Most tumour suppressor genes, you have to lose both copies. This is slightly unusual in that you can have mutations. Although it's a tumour suppressor gene, defective, one defective copy can result in tumour formation. So just a quick reminder of the P53 gene and what it's doing and its gene product. P53 protein here is um, a sensor of DNA damage. So if DNA damage occurs, P53 protein becomes phosphorylated by these enzymes. We get activated P53 and that will drive P53 response genes, typically BACs, which drives apoptosis, P21 drives cell cycle arrest, and uh, DNA damage uh, repair genes are driven by P53. So that's the function of P53. You get DNA damage, you get activated P53, you drive BACs, P21, and DNA damage repair genes, um, and that allows the cell to repair the DNA damage whilst preventing proliferation, whilst priming the cell for cell suicide, just in case the DNA damage can't be repaired. Now this is very, very fundamental to tumour formation because this DNA damage is, can be what drives cancer formation. We know that cancers have lots of mutations. If cells do not express P53, then none of these P53 response genes get expressed. So you don't get BACs expression, and BACs drives apoptosis, programmed cell death. You don't get P P21 expressed, P21 stops the cell cycle. And you don't get DNA repair genes expressed, DNA repair genes repair DNA, and that further exacerbates the accumulation of mutations. So just like PRB and the RB1 gene, the P53 coding gene is very, very frequently mutated and inactivated in cancer. And the sorts of things that can happen in cancer is the P53 gene itself is, becomes mutated, so it's inactive, or the MDM2 protein can be overexpressed, which gets rid of P53. Either of those, thing, those two things can happen. They both lead to a P53 deficient uh, phenotype. And also the HPV uh, protein, e, uh, protein called E6, which I'll mention in a moment, also inactivates P53. So this is what I've just mentioned. How does P53 loss lead to cancer? P53 uh, gene mutation or deletion can occur, or you can have an MDM2 overexpression, or you could also have uh, a gene mutation of the phosphorylating enzymes that stabilize P53. That would be these enzymes here, CHECK2, ATM, and ATR. If you inactivate those, you can't phosphorylate P53, 
if you lose your p53 gene you can't make p53 if you overexpress mdm2 mdm2 will degrade the p53 protein if we've got complete loss of p53 protein we've got loss of the p53 induced genes such as bax no apoptosis p21 no cell cycle arrest and this is why human papillomavirus also inactivates p53 it means that the cells will be driven through the cell cycle and will not die. So you'll probably hear about this uh, again this week. You have a lecture dedicated to HPV. But just as a quick uh, reminder, HPV inactivates both PRB and P53. So the E6 oncogene from the uh, human papilloma virus genome, the E6 oncogene inactivates P53. The E7 oncoprotein inactivates PRB. Uh, there's also the E2 gene which acts as a negative regulator for both of these and this often gets disrupted by accidental viral integration into the host cell genome. So that results in a complete loss of PRB and P53 due to overexpression of E6 and E7. So a little thing to think about here. Given that E6 and E7 remove all functional P53 and PRB protein when infected with human papillomavirus, what do you think the mutation spectrum would be of the TP53 gene and the, PR and the RB1 gene in the cell that is infected with HPV? So you've got HPV in the cell, that's taking away all the P53 protein and PRB protein. Do you think that those cells would have mutations in the P53 and the RB and the P53 and the PRB coding genes. So have a little think about that, because this is a situation that's completely unique to cervical cancers, and we can discuss this in the live session. Okay, so hopefully you've had a little think about that. Now I'm going to talk about P53 mutations in a different setting because cervical cancer, HPV-induced cancers have a very unique uh, mutation spectrum. Um, so I'd say I'll talk about those in a live session. But I'm going to talk about P53 compared to other major tumor suppressor genes. And this shows a mutational spectrum of missense mutations, which are cha uh, changes that code, change one code onto another. We've got frame shift mutations, which are classically found in tumor suppressor genes because they shift the frame shift and that stops protein production. Nonsense mutations are premature stop codons. Splice sites tend to affect the reading frame of a, an mRNA and therefore affect translation. So frame shift, deletions, nonsense and splice sites all inactivate uh, the gene. Missense mutations can also inactivate the gene. If you change one amino acid for another, the gene product, the protein, no longer functions. However, as we will find out for oncogenes, this can actually activate a protein. Now something really unusual happens with P53 and we get a huge over-representation of missense mutations. These are mutations that change one amino acid for another and they also occur just in one small region of the gene. And this is actually classic of oncogene activation rather than tumor suppressor gene inactivation. So something unusual is going on with P53. And this is shown here. Uh, P53 often picks up what we call dominant negative mutations. So dominant negative mutations are mutations which are inactivating, so you end up with no functional P53, but they are dominant over the wild type protein. Now this works only if the mutations are in a certain bit of the gene uh, and a certain part of the protein, P53 itself is tetrameric, that's four subunits all held together and that's a functional transcription factor. However, if you have a cell which has got one mutated copy of the gene and one wild type copy of the gene, then these four subunits will come together in a random fashion and if 50% of the protein is wild type, 50% is mutant, then these are the possible ways in which you could generate a tetramer of P53. And what you can see is 15 out of 16 of the possible ways of putting this together randomly would contain at least one mutant P53 subunit. And if at least one of them is mutant, the whole subunit 
the whole um, PP3 protein is defective. So rather than just having a 50% reduction in protein, we're actually getting a near 95% reduction in functional protein by a single missense mutation. And these are the dominant negative mutations. And this is why here we've got an overrepresentation of missense mutations. Most of these are dominant negative mutations, which are inactivating, effectively inactivating both mutant and wild type protein at the same time. So some cancers, you have deletion of one copy of the P53 gene that reduces protein by 50%, and then you require a second somatic mutation. So that's a classic two hit mutation pattern of a tumor suppressor gene, whereas the dominant negative mutations follow a one hit pattern. That is one key mutation in, the, in one copy of the gene can produce a protein product that inactivates the wild type protein. Now, from a uh, histopathology uh, side of things, this is a really important finding because you will come across, uh, if you work in histopathology, you will come across P53 immunostaining. And P53 immunostaining is to find out whether the P53, the tumours express P53. But it's paradoxical. Some of these missense mutations produce mutated P53, which is stable and accumulates within the cells. And that is these dominant negative forms. They're highly stable and they are very difficult for the cell to get rid of. So they accumulate and you end up with tumours that are absolutely packed full of P53. All the brown stain cells are epithelial cells. The blue nuclei are just connective tissue there. So as we've seen, P53 is degraded by MDM2 and MDM2 is part of the negative feedback loop to degrade P53. So here's our P53. P53 activates MDM2. MDM2 comes along, tries to degrade P53. That's the classic negative feedback loop. However, the mutant forms of P53 cannot be degraded by MDM2, so they accumulate in the cell. Not only do they accumulate in the cell, they can't be because they can't be degraded, you get more of the mutant form than the wild type form and the mutant form sort of outcompetes the wild type form so the cell becomes effectively P53 protein deficient even though one of its copies of the uh, P53 coding gene is intact. So what we can see in these images this has got a dominant negative mutation and you can see from the code R248Q that's arginine to uh, glutamine, so arginine to glutamine, or uh, this mutation here, we're looking at a missense mutation changing one codon to another codon. That is creating the inactive P53 protein, but this mutation, uh, the mutant form, binds to the wild type form, forms a tetramer that inactivates the wild type form from being active. So when you see very strong positive P53 staining, it correlates with an absence of P53 protein activity. Here we've got two cancers which are showing uh, low levels of P53. This is probably just background P53 levels. P53 levels rise and fall as cells that get DNA damage. So these are likely to be wild type. And then this on the end, where you've got a complete absence of P53 protein, is likely to represent a cancer where both copies of the P53 gene have been inactivated and we call this a P53 null genotype. So we have no protein whatsoever, whereas here we've got loads of protein, it's just non-functional. Here, both copies of the gene are inactivated in a two-hit model, and this is P53 negative, or P53 null. Okay, that's the end of part one of this uh, lecture. Um, part two will come up next, and that is uh, mechanisms of oncogene activation.